in the financial sector, at the time, they, weren't, they wouldn't have dared said, we're going to buy common stock in banks, because people would have said, that's socialism, you can't do that. You can't have the federal government owning banks, that's crazy. So they didn't say that. What they said was the government's going to, um, the first it was going to be they were just going to buy the troubled assets. That's what's called TARP, the Troubled Asset Relief Program. So there's these mortgage-backed securities and things that were on the books of all these banks, making the banks insolvent. And so the government was going to come in and just buy those things off of the books. And so Henry Paulson, who was the Treasury Secretary under Bush, that was the plan he sold to Congress. He got authorization to do it. And then literally within days, he said, oh, no, actually, we can't do that. That would be stupid. We're not going to do that. After he got the authority, you know, got $700 billion in his pocket, he decided he was going to do something else with it. And so they made loans to these banks. And plenty of these banks, they weren't voluntary loans. That Paulson called them in, all these big bankers, handed them out you know, portfolio, you know, folders saying, this is how much the loan we're going to give you. And, and he said words to the effect that you're not leaving this room until you all agree to this. Okay? And so you had all these big banks taking loans from the government. And then what happened now once the Obama administration took over is you had all these controversies about how much the bonuses were. And so Washington was saying, okay, well, we're going to start telling you how much you could pay your executives. And the, the authority they were citing, they were, you know, because the government can't just tell a private business how much to pay your executives. That would be like fascism or socialism or something, you can't do that, right? Well, no, it's because you have TARP money, all right? So, the, so they're saying because you have taxpayer funds, we have the authority to dictate your business to you. But of course, many of these banks, they didn't want the funds in the first place. They were forced to take it. And so then you had banks trying to pay these things back. And the government, just now, a few banks are being allowed to repay the loan. Okay, so again, just to give you an idea of how crazy things are, these banks were forced to take money they want to give it back now because they realize, look at all these rules, you're, you're telling us how we can pay our executives, take the money back, and the government now is saying, okay, we'll let some of you pay the money back. All right, and there's all sorts of speculation about, you know, once, once the government has a kind of power over you, for example, Wells Fargo Bank, a few months ago, called what these things were called stress tests, where the government was going to run simulations to see how strong various banks were, and the guy running Wells Fargo said that that's asinine. He said the whole process is ass and it's stupid. And now, lo and behold, Wells Fargo is, is you know, being, the results of the stress test come out and Wells Fargo has to go raise more capital, whereas some of these other banks will give it a, a, you know, a gold star. All right, so there's a lot of speculation among people that you know, the idea is that the more power the government's getting, you know, people, if you criticize the government, now they have so much leeway over you or so much um, influence, they can always come up with a way to punish you for you know, criticizing the administration. Okay, but so there's, you got taken over the financial sector. That by itself would have been a big deal. You know, if they had done nothing but that, I would have been, you know, pulling the little hair I have left out, warning about, look at the socialism that's coming out here. But that's that's nothing. They, okay, they did that. They're doing cap and trade. You know, which you, I'm running out of time here, so I'll, I'll keep this really brief. But you know, in, in the Q and A, if you want to talk about that, I've done a lot of research on this. But again, for you know, for the, they they've done it in Europe. Now the U.S. wants to do what they have what's called the uh, Waxman Markey Bill that's pending. And they want to cut U.S. greenhouse gas emissions by 83 percent by the year 2050, and I mean that's that would bring U.S. emissions back to like the level they were in the 1930s. Okay, just to give you an idea of how drastic a cut back that would be, and so again, just this, this sort of pattern that they're trying to do everything the way they did it back in the 1930s. And um, okay, so they're they're trying to take over the energy sector, take over the banking sector. But that's not they're not done. They, of course, literally own automobile companies now, two of the big three. And they're, you had the President of the United States talking about automobile warranties a couple of months ago. I mean, just again, that, that's crazy. That would have been a joke a few years ago, but now that's standard practice. They own the car companies. You have, uh, oh, they're going to they're take over health care now, too. They're going to fix health care and insure everybody. Right? So all these huge sectors of the U.S. economy, they just keep ticking off. And they, you know, how long have they even been in office? They're doing all these things, huge power grab. So if you believe in the free market, these things have to, this has to be bad news, right? The government can't just take over everything, bring the U.S. very close to outright central planning, and then just assume that, oh, you'll have a little dip in output, but things will be normal. So that's why I'm very pessimistic about the actual economic output from the U.S., at least for the next 10 years. Because again, the last time they've done this, they did things of this magnitude, was the 1930s, and we saw what happened back then. All right, so you got that, but then that's not the extent of it. On top of all that is the Federal Reserve has pumped in just an incredible amount of, 
what's called the, the monetary base. Uh, it, it gets a little technical. I'll try to simplify. But all right, so when, when the Federal Reserve, when they, when they engage in what's called open market operations, and this is what central banks around the world do. It's not unique to the Fed. So when the Fed wants to provide liquidity or do things like that, they go into the market and they buy, let's say, a million dollars of, of, of U.S. bonds from a bond dealer. So they write a check on the Federal Reserve, give it to the bond dealer, and now the Fed puts on its balance sheet a million dollars more in bonds. And then that person who sold the bonds has a check now from the Fed for a million dollars. They deposit it in their bank account, and ultimately, you know, some bank somewhere where that check ends up settling, now that bank has its account with the Fed go up by a million dollars. Okay, so the Fed, when it writes checks, that money's just drawn out of thin air. It's not like the Fed has some finite amount of reserves that it draws down to write checks. No, when the Fed writes a check, you know, it could write a check for two quadrillion dollars and it would clear because it's the Fed, it creates the money, right? So, all right, so the problem, so what happened, if you go look at these statistics, so some of you may have seen this, but if you look, so, so going back, the monetary base basically refers to the Fed's, you know, the reserves that banks have with the Fed, so it's like a bank's checking account with the Fed, if you will, plus uh, actual cash, you know, green pieces of paper that are in circulation. Um, so if you, if you look at that figure, so I'll do it from your point of view, you know, it was, it was going along like this for, for decades. You know, the Fed was founded in 1913, it's down here, and then within the last eight months or so, it shoots up like that. Like the rate of percent was over 10,000% at an annualized rate. All right, so it was just a huge, um, in terms of the, the excess reserves in the system. Um, another way of putting it is the Federal Reserve doubled its balance sheet over the last year, okay? So it's just a huge increase. So now people, so that has a very um, serious potential for price inflation. And yet you haven't seen that yet. And the re it's, again, it's, it's really complicated, but the, the reason is those banks are just sitting on that. So all these banks, they have plenty of reserves on deposit with the Fed, and they have the legal ability, if they wanted to, they could start advancing all kinds of loans. And because you know they have a fractional reserve system, they really only need to keep about, for all the loans a bank has outstanding, it needs to have 10% of that, roughly, either cash in the vault or reserves on deposit with the Fed. And so right now, they have more than 100% backed up in reserves. In other words, the reserves have risen so much, but they've loaned out, you know, they haven't loaned out nearly as much in the increase. And so banks right now have over 100% reserves when legally they only need to have 10% reserves. So to, to give you an idea, just a back of the envelope calculation, this was true about five months ago. I think the figure is probably still basically the same. That if the banks lent out all the money that they were legally able to do, the, the stock of dollars you know, in, held by the public would go up by a factor of 10. Right. I'm not saying 10%, I'm saying a factor of 10. And so that, that just gives you an idea of the amount of possible inflation that Bernanke has you know, front-loaded into the system and that may trickle out if, if things uh, go a certain way. So, like I said, the reason you don't see that yet because it's all bottled up in the banking system. They have these huge reserves and they're not lending it out. There's a couple reasons why aren't they lending it out. One is just because the environment's so bleak that you know, no banker wants to start advancing new loans when they just got burned for all their excessive lending and um, you know, default rates are rising across the board, all sorts of credit instruments. So banks aren't really in a good mood right now to be lending out all kinds of money. So that's one reason. Another thing is the Fed also changed its policy and it now pays interest on reserves. So if a bank keeps its money in its, the Fed checking account, if you will, the Fed's paying interest on that, whereas it didn't used to. That, that's a new thing that they introduced uh, I think like about six or seven months ago, actually more like a year ago. Okay, so so that's 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 why the thing's in a sort of equilibrium right now. But the the problem is, <coughs> excuse me, that once you know, let's say we get through this this recession, and a lot of people are speculating that you know the worst of this dip right now is over and things will be back to normal for a little bit. Once banks start lending that money out, you know, Greenspan and others across the board have said we're going to need to suck out those reserves from the system because you know, obviously we can't sit back and let them, the overall money supply go up by a factor of 10. And, but the problem is, how does the Fed suck money out of the system is they do the opposite of what I just said five minutes ago. Right now their balance sheet's really big. They need to sell off those assets so that someone writes a check on their bank to the Fed. The Fed gets that check and just rips it up because it, you know, 